Welcome to Psy Body Therapy Anatomy Labs. Today we're gonna to be talking about polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS. This is an endocrine condition that causes disorder in the hormones and metabolic functions. To completely understand PCOS, I think it's important that we establish what a normal cycle looks like. So there are a pair of hormones from the brain called LH and FSH, which are sent out gradually and in waves to the ovary. At the ovary, they stimulate several different cysts, which develop into follicles. Eventually, one of them makes it all the way to the point of ovulation. Now, normally, due to the cycle and that sort of up and down motion of those hormones, those follicles will actually atrophy and they will go away. And then you will have a period and the whole cycle will start over again. Another element of physiology we need to go over is what normally happens to these follicles while they're maturing. So as they are growing, they actually take testosterone and convert it using aromatase, which is an enzyme, into estrogen. And that is what gives you those bumps in the menstrual cycle. In PCOS, because the hormone signals from the brain are not making it there or are not stimulating the ovary correctly, these individual cysts never reach the point where they begin that conversion. And so instead of getting estrogen out the other side, you get a buildup of testosterone. As you can probably imagine, having testosterone, a predominantly male hormone, rising at sort of an uncontrolled rate inside of a female body can produce a whole host of problems. Let's talk about symptoms. The very first one that most people who menstruate are going to notice is going to be either an absent or highly irregular period. And when I say irregular, I don't mean more often, I mean with extended periods between. So it may be two, three, six months between each period. Having irregular or absent ovulation is obviously going to make it incredibly difficult to get pregnant. And one of the side effects of that rising level of testosterone is that even if you are able to get pregnant, the risk of miscarriage is extremely high. One of the other things that we need to talk about here that often gets glossed over, if you are having irregular periods where you are going a very long time without having a menstrual cycle, you need to talk to your doctor about that because that can mean that the uterine lining, the endometrium, is actually building up continuously. And this can increase your risk of endometrial cancer. Now, not everyone is concerned about having children. That may not even be a concern for you. The other side of managing this disease is the physical symptoms or the changes to your phenotype that come with it. And those are going to include things like acne, male pattern baldness, uh, facial hair, which is also called hirsutism, and you may have dark patchy skin, especially on the neck. That dark patchy skin is actually linked to the other side of this, which are internal physical changes that can lead to weight gain, insulin insensitivity, and if those aren't addressed, eventually diabetes and heart disease. If you're checking off the symptoms above, I'm sure that the next category is not going to be unfamiliar to you because those are going to be the mental side effects. Those can include depression, anxiety, aggression, and mood swings. And those are going to be a direct result from the hormone levels being thrown off throughout the body. If you're watching this and you are concerned that you may have PCOS, I want you to pay attention and write down this next part. This is called the Rotterdam criteria. Okay, these are three symptoms or physiological changes that you have to have in order to be diagnosed with PCOS. To be clear, you only need two of the three. So the first one is going to be hyperandrogenism. That is that rise in testosterone. Those are also called androgens. The second criteria is going to be ovulatory dysfunction. So that is going to be that irregular or absent period. The third criteria addresses the ovary and its physical appearance alone, and that is going to be the polycystic element of this. So this would be where you go in for an ultrasound and they will find that there are now permanent changes to the surface of your ovary. That is going to be those persistent follicles. 
Here, if you're ready to head to the doctor, let's talk about tests that they may be looking at or you may want to request. The very first one is actually going to be an androgen level test. So they're just going to look for testosterone and other androgens in your blood. The next couple are actually going to be looking for metabolic changes. And so there may be a complete lipid panel, a glucose test to see where your blood sugar levels are, and an A1C. A1C tests actually kind of take a look at the history of your blood sugar and give you a more complete view of what's actually happening. And then it's very likely that they will want to take a look at the ovary itself. So you may be looking at an ultrasound. They will take a look at both sides and they will see if you have any of these cysts. You may end up having more than one because they will want to confirm that they are actually persistent and not just part of the normal ovulatory cycle. Here I want to warn you that I'm going to show you some images of this. We are going to start with some ultrasound pictures and then we are going to move to some actual real images of polycystic ovarian syndrome. So these here are ultrasound images of polycystic ovarian syndrome. In here you will see those persistent follicles that are just kind of, you know, taking over the ovarian surface. It's important to remember that you can see images like this and not have polycystic ovarian syndrome. Cyst development is a normal part of ovulation. The difference is going to be their persistence. And this is why you may have more than one ultrasound to see if they are just kind of hanging out causing problems. We are going to now take a look at real tissue examples of what polycystic ovarian syndrome looks like. So these images here are showing what happens when these persistent cysts, cysts alter the appearance of the ovary. You can see partially, even just structurally, you can see where the ovaries uh, ability to do anything would be impeded just physically. The structure is changing so much that it just can't do its job anymore. So let's talk about treatment. Now this is largely split between the people who are looking to have a child, addressing the infertility, and people who just want to better their health overall, maybe take care of some of the physical appearance. This right here is going to be a general list of medications that may be recommended to you, or you may have interest in learning more about. So estrogen, estradiol, and progestin are going to be trying to regulate things and get that complete signal, hopefully moving toward fertility. Uh, those next two there are going to be also fertility oriented, trying to get you to the point where you can have a child. There are some other uses for them that may have some overlap with the physical part of it. So it's not a this or that. You may actually see a combination of these things. Metformin and semeglutide are going to be oriented on regulating the metabolic component of this. So it's going to be attacking blood glucose levels, uh, weight loss, and that element of it. And those are going to be long-term protection from diabetes and heart disease. And that last category there is some of the heavier hitters. Those can come with some pretty solid side effects. They are going to be androgen blockers or anti-androgen medications. I know not all of you are going to be about the big pharma treatment. So I do want to give you a list of supplements that may help with PCOS. Now, I do not sell these or anything like that. I'm always hesitant to even put this list up. Do treat them like medications. Let's go over a couple of them. The very first one there, the N-acetylcysteine, is a precursor to glutathione, which is produced by the liver. This can help with the pain and inflammation that can be associated with PCOS. That next one there is a mouthful. It's diindolomethane. Or if you want to save yourself the tongue twister, you can just call it DIM. This is also found naturally in foods like cauliflower, and it is a natural estrogen regulator. Myo-inositol is one that you can get online, but it is definitely one you want to talk to your doctor about because it can come with some pretty heavy-duty side effects. 
Another one to note on this list is berberine. Now, berberine is directly related or has the same effects as metformin. And the issue with the natural version of this is that it can vary wildly even if you stick with the same supplement. So if you're gonna consider berberine for helping control blood glucose, that might be the one that I would encourage you to go at least explore metformin because I think you would probably have a better result. Turmeric, if you've never heard of it, is just that little yellow spice that you probably have in your spice cupboard. Uh, it has anti-inflammatory aspects to it and it can suppress testosterone production. That last one's actually really important to note if you are a male and you take large amounts of turmeric, it can actually suppress, uh, it can suppress testosterone in us as well. Ashwagandha and maca root are going to be aimed at the mental part of this. They can help with depression and anxiety, and you may find them beneficial. I want to reiterate that if you are on medications or you're considering adding these to your regimen, please consult your doctor and treat them like medications. Let's say you're the type of person who doesn't want to do medications and you don't want to do supplements. You want to treat this from lifestyle changes alone, or at least attempt to. There are a few options. There's basically three. You're going to have to look at your diet. Now, research says that the Mediterranean and the DASH diets may have the greatest effect or greatest benefit when it comes to something like polycystic ovarian syndrome. On the upside, both of these dietary models also provide a lot of benefits for things like weight gain and insulin sensitivity, as well as heart disease and just your general well-being. The downside to them is they are going to require a lot of effort up front. You're going to need to move slowly, take little pieces, little baby steps, and build into this diet. It's going to be very hard to make broad sweeping changes and then stick to it. The second lifestyle option you have is to increase the amount of fiber that you are taking in. Fiber, if you didn't know, can actually absorb excess hormones. So estrogen, testosterone can actually be bound up as it passes through the intestine and then excreted, obviously, outside of the body. Another benefit to fiber is that it increases satiety, so your sense of fullness, and it also helps regulate blood sugar and the amount of carbohydrate and that stuff that is moving across the intestinal wall. So it can help with things like glucose levels, your blood sugar levels, and insulin sensitivity. The third lifestyle change you can make is supported by the previous two, and that is going to be weight loss. And I can hear the audible ugh, groan when it comes to that because a lot of people with PCOS, when they go into the doctor, that is the sole piece of advice they are handed. They just tell them to lose weight and the problem will go away. As with all things though, the upside here is that it's only 10% of your weight. So wherever you are sitting at, you need to lose 10% of that number to get the first round of benefits. All right, let's talk about the groan because I know weight loss is hard. It's just like if you're a smoker, every time you go in, that's the first thing. Well, you should quit smoking. Obviously, we understand that losing weight is a healthy option. No one denies that. But losing weight and keeping it off is very difficult. And when you have something that is affecting your hormones and your metabolism directly, it can become an insurmountable obstacle. I wanna make sure you know that there is no shame in asking for help. So things like metformin and the semeglutide and any other weight loss aid that you may need, it is okay to do that. Weight loss is hard and obesity more and more is being linked to being an actual disease, which means it needs treatment. Let's talk about the why though. Why do they push weight loss so hard whenever you have something like polycystic ovarian syndrome? Well, that is because our fat cells are not just little storage boxes. They are biologically active and fat cells can actually have an effect on your hormone levels. So they can make estrogen rise, they can make testosterone rise, they can make them fall. And that is all through a complex feedback, feedback loop that is not completely understood. As you gain more weight, the pancreas starts to respond and you can end up with insulin insensitivity. So that is where your pancreas is trying to do its job. It is trying to store 
sugar in the fat cells, but the fat cells are insensitive to that little molecule. Insulin normally picks up sugar and kind of stores it away in the fat cell. That's a very simplified version of what's happening. When you are insulin insensitive, that sugar just stays free floating in your bloodstream where it can cause damage. The other thing that happens is as insulin levels rise, they have a direct effect on the ovary and can cause it to produce even more testosterone. The key element here is that if you lose weight, if you empty out those fat cells, they start to downregulate both of those mechanisms we just talked about. So your pancreas does not have to work as hard and that feedback loop to the ovary can actually resume or be normalized. I sincerely hope that addressed why they push weight loss so hard. If not, please leave me a comment and I will try and explain it further. We're winding down. We only have one last thing to talk about, and that is going to be surgical options. There's really only a couple, and they're not great options. So the very first one is called PCOS drilling, or ovarian drilling. And I'm gonna show you a picture of that. I want to warn you that it's coming because it might be a little triggering for you. What they do is they go in, mostly endoscopically, and basically punch holes in all of those cysts to stop them from producing testosterone. Now this particular treatment, the ovarian drilling, is aimed at fertility. It is not, a, it is not meant to be a cure or anything that. It is a means to a goal, which would be having a child. If you're not interested in that, this option is really off the table. The next one is something people ask about often is if it's the ovaries that are driving this, can we just take them out? Well, that is actually an option. People have tried it. Unfortunately, testosterone is not only produced in the ovaries. Uh, your adrenal glands can also step in and begin producing testosterone. So taking out the ovaries, it may help, but it may also not. Sadly, no matter which option you pick, if you go medications, supplements, or lifestyle changes, or even surgery, there is not a cure for PCOS. It becomes a chronic thing that you are going to have to manage for your entire life. Now, lots of these things can make it easier or help you reach singular goals, which is maybe all that you need. A real quick side note here, PCOS is not defined as a chronic pain disorder. I personally have a problem with this because it is one of the symptoms that gets discounted very often by anyone who has this. It does seem the ovary is loaded with nerve endings and can detect pain. If you've ever had ovulation pain, you know what that's all about. That's called middle schmerz. It's actually mid-cycle pain. And so the idea that an ovary that is being uh, ravaged by all these little cysts is not going to hurt is a little absurd to me. So this is a symptom that I'm going to put on this list but is often left off. Do not let anyone convince you that if you are feeling something that it is just in your head. I know that we have gone over a lot of information, so if you want a nice summary of this, I actually have a guide over on Patreon that's the tiny guide to PCOS. It's, a free, it's free to download. You just head over there. You don't have to be a patron or anything. It's freely available. You may have to scroll a little to find it, but you can download it, and it has a simplified version of all this information we went over. If you are a person who is looking for answers and you are bouncing from one condition to the next, trying to see if your symptoms match it, or you just like learning about women's health issues, I would like to take you to the next video in this series, which is all about endometriosis. And this is gonna be helpful if you're just interested in learning and knowing more for the women in your life, or if you are someone who is exploring looking for answers.